Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I am here today to give you my final verdict on the new Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter. This is the F2.8 DI, which means it's for full frame. It has got VC, which is uh, Tamron's vibration compensation or image stabilization. And it is a USD, which means it's got an ultra ultrasonic drive focus motor, a ring type AF uh, USM type focus motor. And it is the G2 or the second generation lens. Now, in my first look episode, I broke down how the new physical design compares to the older generation lens. This new one is a Tamron code AO41. The previous generation was AO12. What we found is that there are a significant number of real improvements in this lens. Um, and those break down in things like a, a more high-end build grade, which has a more modern design. It also has far more metal in the construction as opposed to engineered plastics. And uh, at the same time, however, we saw that there are also a lot of physical similarities in terms of the size and the basic dimensions. And some of you asked, and I should have mentioned in that first episode, so I will now, and that is that, yes, if you happen to have an aftermarket filter system, for me, for example, I have the um, Photodiox Wonderpana filter system, and it fits perfectly on here. And so I had it for the first generation, and it fits perf perfectly on the G2 lens. So, yes, um, you can use, if you already have filter solutions for the previous gen lens, you can employ them here. There are some improvements in the actual design of both the focus ring and the zoom ring, and uh, it is smoother, although it's still a little bit heavier than what I would like. Now, if there is any kind of criticism of this new finish, it's a great looking lens, but I find that uh, Tamron's newest kind of more matte type finish instead of a flocked finished um, on the like the plastic parts. In this case, the only thing plastic here is this fixed outer lens hood, but I do find that it's prone to marking and, um, and it just shows up things like that. And so I think it will show a little bit more wear and tear, but as far as the uh, metal bits, they seem to be very good. Uh, some of you, you know, kind of went back and forth with me over the design of the switches. And some people apparently have had an issue with Tamron's new design of switches, you know, just um, accidentally engaging them. I, I will say that I have used all of the G2 lenses. I have owned uh, the 70 to 200. I've never once accidentally engaged any of the switches or unengaged them. So I'm not saying that people don't have an issue with that. I'm saying that I can't report an issue that I've never seen and never experienced in you know many hours, perhaps hundreds of hours of use. Beyond that, um, there is some improvements to the internal weather sealing of the lens. There is, in addition, a filter holder here on the back for gel-type filters. And uh, on that note, I talked to the people at Tamron USA, and they are going to make sure to... Tamron has no plans that they know of of making their own filters, and so you're going to have to source, you know, other third-party filters for that and they're going to do their best to research you know best options and include those in the listing on the Tamron USA website because uh, you know I, I said and believe that a lot of you that are interested in filters you may be wanting to look for a place of reference a place to start on that so you might want to stay tuned for that finally this lens is both designed and made in Japan and uh, that's not true of all of Tamron's new releases but for this particular lens, at least the copy that I'm uh, using, that is the case. So as far as the actual physical build now, this is, I would say, very close to the top of the heap for wide-angle zoom lenses. Um, it's a more pro-grade build than what I've seen from some of Tamron's, or excuse me, Canon's um, wide-angle zooms. Uh, it certainly is good or better than what, say, the Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8 or um, other Sigma wide-angle lenses. And so, um, very, very nice build quality. Another improvement here, of course, and this is one of the reasons why Tamron is standardizing all of their kind of pro-grade zoom lenses, 
is that the G2 version, unlike the first edition lens or first generation lens, is compatible with Tamron, Tamron's tap-in console. And so uh, that's a very important addition because it allows Tamron to roll out firmware updates. It allows you to get more precise focus if you, you know, input different calibration values. And so you can input calibration values at three different focus distances and a number of different focus um, focal points in the focus range. And so it allows you to really dial in a lot of precision. It does take a little bit of time. However, I have found with other lenses that if I do take that time, I'm rewarded with really good focus accuracy out of the lens. Now on that note, uh, Tamron has also adopted their newer approach to um, autofocus and vibration compensation um, in this lens in that they now run dual processors in these and so there is one processor that is dedicated now to autofocus. What that means is that you have quieter, faster autofocus, more, um, I would say, torque maybe allotted to the actual action of focus along with more actual electronic algorithms that are in, invested into focus. I had to make, um, in using the lens, I had good autofocus accuracy. I did note that when I was shooting at infinity, um, wide open 30 millimeters, I shot it in the vent setting somewhat. And so I found that I was getting a bit of a front focus. And so I just dialed in uh, some extra a back focus to help to move that plane of focus back and I got really good precision after that. So I, I think that there's a fair chance you will have to invest a little bit of time in calibration, um, but if you'll do that, um, I think you'll be rewarded with a very good and accurately focused lens. And if you aren't familiar with how to do lens calibration, I do have a playlist devoted to that and I'll throw a link to it here. And so byproduct of this is that in a variety of lighting conditions, I got very, very good focus accuracy. And, uh, and I, I tested it at some very low light settings and I found that it did quite well when it comes to that. The other nature of having that dual um, approach to our dual processor approach to autofocus and VC means that you now have a vastly improved VC system. One of Tamron's engineers told me that with the first generation image stabilizers and, you know, for example, this lens, it was rated at, I believe, two and a half stops. And unfortunately, the nature of how it operated meant that it could have a bit of a negative impact on uh, image quality. And there are, of course, a lot of people out there that are completely against image stabilizers for that very reason. They think that they, you know, will negatively impact image quality. And it appears that that could have been the case. The new uh, stabilizer, however, it has a couple of advantages. Number one, it is SEPA rated at 4.5 stops, which is impressively high. And so a good two stops of improvement and Tamron's engineers tell me that it actually exceeds that rating. Uh, but the other advantage is the way that the system now works, it does so in such a way that there is not any kind of negative impact to image quality. A byproduct of that is, is that while we'll touch on image quality in just a second, you will probably get better real world handheld images out of the second generation lens than you would out of the first generation lens for that reason. But I can attest to the fact that the image stabilizer is very, very effective on this lens. Now, on a practical note, I find that there is, I, I find that image stabilizers have more of an impact for me with telephoto lenses than they do with wide angle lenses like this. For the reason that I find, at least with DSLRs, there's a practical limit to how low you can hand hold an image, even if you have a very, very good image stabilizer as you do here. And that is that you get to such slow shutter speed, just the very nature of the movement of the shutter, the mirror box, I find um, becomes difficult to, to effectively hand hold. That being said, I got, um, in some cases, some exposures. Uh, I got, you know, for example, this result, which I believe was um, one sixth of a second. Um, I did get a few fairly decent results at a full one second. Technically, you should be able to go even lower than that. I, I'm not capable of doing so. That being said, I did find that when I use this on a Canon EOS R, 
um, which is a Canon's new full frame mirrorless because there is, uh, there's not a, a mirror there and a mirror box in action. So less vibration when you click the shutter. And of course, you know, particularly with, you know, in other situations, maybe with uh, on the Canon, uh, or excuse me, the Sony A7R Mark III in the silent shutter, you know, electronic shutter mode. There's so little vibration there that you actually can push that a little bit further. And I got one and close to, I, I, you know, some decent, um, not perfect, like pen sharp, but usable two second handheld exposures, which is pretty impressive. So bottom line is, is that the VC does a good job. I'll comment more on focus um, accuracy in just a moment when it comes to using these this lens adaptive. First of all, however, let's take a look at the image quality. We devoted an, uh, a full episode to the image quality, and if you want to take a look at that, you'll be able to get everything in detail. Biggest thing that I found, found with this lens is that um, it has been optimized to deliver a little bit more consistent um, sharpness across the image frame. The uh, first generation lens I, I felt was one of Can or Tamron's very best. It was already an incredibly sharp lens and I, because I've owned it since its introduction basically, I've put it up against a lot of wide angle primes and zooms and I've always felt like it held its own pretty well. It's not to say that it was better than all of them, but it was always competitive and often better in at least some metrics than basically everything that I put up against it. But it was very, very good in the center and a little less good on the edges of the frame. The new lens, G2 lens, has been optimized to deliver a little bit more consistent performance right out to the edges of the frame. And so I find that it is uh, better still um, in my test. And uh, this lens has always um, had a, a certain number of um, positives for it. One of those is extremely low vignette for such a wide angle lens with such a wide aperture. That continues to be the case. This is one of the best wide angle performers when it comes to vignette and is, you know, one and even two stops better of uh, corner sharpness and illumination than some competing lenses. Still very strong there. I did notice a big difference when it came to distortion and um, you know, like lateral chromatic aberration control, those seem to be roughly equal for me. And so there is some, you know, moderate barrel distortion. Fortunately, it corrects very well, very cleanly, if you apply a profile in post-processing. And so maybe not a huge, huge deal, but that is, uh, and I did, I went back and compared to how the Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter compared. And with Sigma, they claim that at infinity, it has basically no distortion, which I think is, is probably true. A lot of these lenses, you're, you're dealing with less distortion, or at least in the sense that you're dealing with less distortion at those distances than at close distances. And, uh, but I found that at close distances, it had only a minor, minor amount, less distortion what the 15 to 30 G2 did. And beyond that, I also found when looking at them that the edge performance was roughly the same at 14 millimeters versus 15 millimeters on this lens. And so I would say that in many ways, they, uh, they compete fairly similarly when it comes to image quality, which is to say some of the very best for a wide angle zoom lens. It does have um, new and improved coatings in addition to what it had before. And what I found when it came to flare resistance is that you can tell it's still the same optical formula with the same vulnerabilities, particularly to angled flare when the uh, sun comes in or the light source comes in at an angle. But what I did find is that the flare pattern has been mitigated in the G2. It's less obvious, a little bit better controlled. And so there is a little bit of progress there when it comes to that. As far as how this lens adapts, I used it both on a Sony a7R Mark III via the Sigma MC11, and then I also used it via the new uh, Canon EF to RF adapter on the new Canon EOS R. And what I found is that in, in both cases, they performed uh, very, very well. With the um, EOS R, it performs essentially like native, which is to say excellent. And, uh, and, and frankly, it worked very well on the the Sony a7R Mark III as well. Autofocus, um, it didn't, it wasn't pulsing or uh, hesitating. It just, uh, it, was, it was doing the job and doing it effectively. And so a good report when it comes to that. The one area where Sigma certainly still has an advantage when it comes to both 
native on Canon and adapting, however, is, is that the Sigma 14 to 24 millimeter f2.8 art is supported by Canon's lens aberration corrections. And so in other words, JPEGs will get corrected in camera. And I believe then also if you're using it, well, I know that if you're using it on the A7R Mark III um, via the MC11, the same is true on Sony. That's not true for the Tamron. And so you're not going to get JPEG in-cam correction, in-camera correction, either on a a Canon DSLR or in an adapted type situation. Um, of course, in post, if you're shooting raw, it doesn't really matter all that much because you apply that on import or apply that as part of your post processing. I think the big challenge for those of you that have the first generation of this lens are going to be to evaluate whether or not the improvements here are worth the um, the cost involved with selling what you have and buying something new. The original lens was already a very, very good lens, and I know that a lot of you are very happy with it. There are definitely some real improvements here, but you're going to have to decide for yourself whether or not those improvements are worth the cost of exchange. In conclusion, I think that Tamron has done a solid job, and this is definitely an evolutionary rather than than um, revolutionary update to this lens, but at the same time, it is well executed. We've got improvements to the build, we've got improvements to the function, and we've got minor improvements to the optics. And <laughs> I think that's about all that you could ask for. I'm Dustin Abbott, and uh, thanks for watching today. If you look in the description down below, you will find a linkage to my, uh, my full written review. You'll also find linkage to the image gallery that I contributed to, and there are a number of photos there um, taken adapted if you want to take a look at that as well. And of course, you can find buying links down below, and beyond that, you can sign up to sign up for my newsletter or follow me on social media, become a patron. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.